By the 1980s, it was obvious to parents that computers were the future. They were starting to appear in some schools, and there was a burgeoning sense that kids needed to learn computers in order to get a leg up. But home computers were still pretty darn expensive. When the Commodore 64 came out in 1982, it cost $595. That is the equivalent of $1,900 today. The Apple Macintosh, launched in 1984, was even more expensive at an eye-watering $2,495. That's about $7,700 today. Even an affluent parent would have had a hard time justifying a purchase like that for their young child, which is where the Sears Talking Computron came in. This model from 1986 was purposefully designed to look like a home computer, but it isn't. This is an interactive electronic educational toy meant to be affordable. I can't find any firm information, but my guess, based on the cost of similar products from the era, is that it would have cost less than $30 in 1986. Speaking of similar toys, the most obvious comparison we can make is to the iconic Texas Instruments Speak and Spell. He's learning spelling with Texas Instruments Speak and Spell. Spell, rain, R-A-I-N, that is correct. She's teaching her brother with speak and spell. H-E-R, that is right. They're learning new words with speak and spell. But don't tell them they're learning. They just think they're having fun. Speak and spell for words, speak and read for stories, speak and math for numbers. From Texas Instruments, they make learning fun. That's because its killer feature was speech synthesis, and it even used the same TI TMC0280 chip. That chip was also used in the speech synthesizer module for the TI-99-4A home computer. That chip was critical for the success and low cost of the talking Computron, and I'll go into more detail about that in a moment. But first, let's explore this device's functions. It has several different activities and games to choose from. In fact, the box helpfully tells us that there are 19 different choices. But that's a bit of a stretch. It lists Hangman and two-player Hangman as separate games. In a similar vein, Addition and Subtraction are listed as separate activities. Still, there's quite a lot to do, at least by 80s standards. All the programs are educational in nature and can be broadly categorized as spelling activities, math activities, or musical activities. The spelling quiz program, for instance, audibly asks the user to spell a particular word. How do you spell village? V-I-L-L-A-G-E. Yes, you are right. Other programs, like Hangman, would likely appeal to an audience still reeling from the possibilities suggested in the movie War Games. How can I talk? It's not a real voice. Uh, this box just interprets signals from the computer and turns them into sound. Shall we play a game? Oh. The math activities are even more straightforward and simply challenge users to solve elementary arithmetic problems. But once again, it does speak the questions out loud with its synthesized voice. What number divided by 4 equals to 37? 1, 4, 8, 148. Yes, you are right. What number minus? Then there are the musical activities. They feel a bit like an afterthought to me, and there are only three of them. All of them work a bit like a melodic version of Simon Says. The user gets eight buttons for Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do, covering the notes of a single octave. All user interaction occurs through the keyboard, which is a membrane style reminiscent of the keyboard on the uh, Sinclair ZX81 that everyone hated so much. While it worked throughout my testing without issue, it certainly wasn't pleasant. There isn't any tactile feedback whatsoever, so you have to rely on visual and auditory cues to be sure that you really pushed a button. 
The visual cues come from the built-in display. The talking Computron is supposed to look like it has a monitor, but it's just an eight-digit LED segment display. We do, however, get more than seven segments. Some digits have more than others, so all alphanumeric characters are very readable. Auditory cues come from the speaker paired with the aforementioned TI-TMC0280 chip, and that is what makes the talking Computron interesting, in my opinion. To understand why that chip is a big deal, you need to know a little bit about the history and development of digital audio technology. But before we dive into that, let me tell you about this video's sponsor. Do you like taking stuff apart? How about putting that stuff back together? An electric screwdriver can make that kind of work so much more enjoyable. And this one from X-Cool is great. The X-Cool Mini Electric Precision Screwdriver Set is available on the Cool Gadget Store and on Amazon. You may even be able to catch the Amazon Prime Day sale if you act fast enough. I really like this set because it's really well thought out and the quality is great. The screwdriver itself has a metal body and it's very powerful for its size. It has a 400 RPM motor and the electric torque is adjustable from 0.1 to 0.3 newton meters. There are some very cool features like a built-in light and a digital display, but my favorite is the accessory kit. The x Mini Electric Screwdriver set comes with this nifty aluminum base. It has a sneak button to pop out the insert, which has storage for all three eight of the included bits. And the best part is the USB-C port, which lets you charge the screwdriver while it's in the case. If you want this set, check out the links in the video's description. All right, now we can get back to the early days of digital audio. Alec over on the Technology Connections YouTube channel has a fantastic video on this subject, and I'll put a link to that in the description. But the basic gist is this. Digital audio was a challenge because it requires a relatively massive amount of storage. Converting an analog signal into digital values and back was also a technical hurdle, but engineers solved that pretty early on. Storing all the resulting data, on the other hand, was a much bigger challenge. To put this into perspective, consider the size of an audio file. A three-minute song stored at a standard uncompressed stereo CD quality requires almost 32 megabytes of storage. For reference, the first five and a quarter inch hard drive from Seagate, the ST506 model released in 1980, had a capacity of just five megabytes. So storing digital audio went from nearly impossible to just wildly expensive. Clearly, there was a big demand for some other solution, and that solution was synthesis. A three minute recording of a square wave tone may require 32 megabytes, but it only takes a few bytes, not megabytes, just bytes, to tell a computer to oscillate a pin at a specific frequency in order to produce that same square wave tone for any arbitrary amount of time. Other more pleasant waveforms require additional hardware, but the point still stands. Commands to generate simple tones require far less storage than recordings of those same tones. The Texas Instruments TMC0280 chip took that concept and applied it to synthesized speech. It seems advanced, but achieving that was actually easier than storing recorded digital audio. That's possible because speech is just combinations of a relatively small set of distinct sounds called phonemes. English has 44 phonemes, so the TMC0280 only needed to be capable of synthesizing those 44 unique sounds. Synthesizing an entire word was as simple as chaining together the sounds to form that word, and synthesizing a sentence was as simple as chaining together words. The word cat, for example, contains three phonemes. If a computer uses an entire byte to represent a phoneme, it would only require three bytes to tell the computer how to say cat. In practice, it's even better. We can cover all 44 phonemes with just six bits. A synthesized sentence actually requires less storage space than it would take to write out the same sentence using the basic ASCII character set. And the talking Computron fully takes advantage of those facts. According to the manual, it comes with 122 built-in words. The maximum length of a word is eight characters, as restricted by the size of the display. To get a conservative guess, we'll estimate that each word needs 16 bytes, eight for the text and another eight for the phonemes. So the entire dictionary only needs 1,952 bytes, meaning it will fit on a two kilobyte ROM chip. In reality, it would almost certainly be possible to optimize this to take up even less space. Most of the words, for example, have fewer than eight characters and phonemes. But what if a kid got bored with the dictionary of 122 built-in words? That's where the cartridges come in. 
Sears sold expansion cartridges that fit into this slot here. They came paired with printed storybooks, which would help kids learn the new words in context. When inserted into the Talking Computron, that cartridge's words would then be added to the dictionary and would be available in the various activities. The Let's Visit the Zoo cartridge, for instance, adds words like parrot and zebra. Based on what we already know about how the Talking Computron works, we can make an educated guess about how the cartridges introduce new words. If a cartridge contains a small ROM chip, the Computron could access that whenever necessary to select a new word. The cartridge adds 100 words, so it likely has a similar amount of storage as the Talking Computron itself. To test that theory, I cracked open the Dress Up and Theater cartridge and took a look inside. The only thing in the plastic enclosure is an incredibly simple PCB with just two components, a capacitor and a chip on board hidden in black epoxy. I don't have the ability to check what's in the epoxy, but I think it's safe to say that it is a very low capacity ROM chip. The alternative would have been in storing the entire dictionary in the Talking Computron's built-in ROM with the cartridges acting as access keys. That is a strategy used in many other products over the years, but I don't think that's the case here. Not only would that have increased the cost of the Talking Computron itself, which would be a bad marketing strategy, but it would have limited the potential for future stories. That said, I can only find evidence of the existence of four different cartridges, Dress Up in Theater, Let's Visit the Zoo, A Day to Bake, and Rocket to Xenod. I believe that all those were available upon the initial release of the Talking Computron, so they could have taken the access key approach if they wanted to. This technology is interesting, but an important question remains. Is the Talking Computron fun? These storybooks aren't technological at all. They're just very short, illustrated stories that contain the words from their respective cartridges. I guess the idea was that kids would read a storybook to learn the new words in context, then insert the cartridge to test their knowledge on the Talking Computron. Most of the time, this all works pretty well, though I think kids would have become bored very quickly, but there are some quirks. For example, it is sometimes very difficult to understand the word being synthesized. There is a repeat button for exactly this situation, but some words are just indecipherable to my ears. How do you spell biscuit? Biscuit. 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 Talking Computron also lacks the ability to account for gameplay issues. For instance, Dress Up in Theater contains the words bed and red. If you're playing the missing letter game, you might get blank ED. In that case, either word would be correct. This is really hard to test as both the word and the missing letter are random, so I wasn't able to determine definitively if it would accept either answer. Regardless, if you were to answer wed, it would say that you are wrong because it doesn't know that that word exists. It isn't unusual to see this problem in electronic games, but it's glaring here because the dictionary is so small. Cartridges add about 100 words, so the dictionary never has more than about 220 words available, and Talking Computron won't recognize a word that isn't in the dictionary. But I'm not sure if any of this actually mattered to the kids of the 80s. The original Computron, which didn't talk, came out in 1980. Then the Talking Computron came out in 1986, so this wasn't a complete flop. They also aren't particularly rare, and I had no trouble finding this one on eBay for about 30 bucks. Still, I have a hard time believing that many kids got long-term use out of their Talking Computrons. The activities wouldn't be challenging for long, and I can't find any other cartridges aside from the four I mentioned already. It honestly feels like the kind of thing a well-meaning grandparent would have bought for their grandkid after hearing that they're into computers. But maybe I'm wrong about that. If you played with one of these as a kid, I'd love to hear about your experience. In my opinion, this is an interesting and quirky piece of history. In many ways, it reminds me of the Mattel Aquarius computer, as it seems to bridge the gap between a toy and a computer. It isn't a general purpose computer by any means, at least not any more than a calculator is, but it's really impressive what they were able to achieve in this market segment. I think this would have seemed pretty advanced for something on the toy aisle at Sears in the 80s. If you have any additional information about these, let us know in the comments, and thanks for watching.